In fact, I'm recording it as we I just now starting the recording. Um, this this important information for you to have so that you can use it as the basis or the background. The information I'm going to present to you today, which is which is found on these maps, comes from the Percept Company, which is a company that works for churches. Uh, as I told you, or may I not have, but we purchased this uh, as a consortium, as a collaboration earlier in the year, and it covers all of our churches' areas. And so this material that you're looking at is particular to your county, your zip code. Uh, and it's not anecdotal. What I mean by that is you may anecdotally disagree with it. You may say, those aren't people that I know. I understand that. I'm not arguing about your own personal experience. But this information is based upon the latest of two uh, sources. One is the census material, which right now is, is 2010, but you know they update it every year. So it's the latest census material. And they just finished about two years ago what they call a business uh, background census, which they're going to be repeating, I think, next year. Uh, they do that on a regular basis as well. So this is the latest up-to-date information. Any organization, government, local, charitable, whatever, that taps these databases is looking at exactly this same information. It's not tailored for us, except just that it's uh, that it's it's given to us by zip code. Uh, they're not filtering it to us. They're going to be uh, sharing with us. Now, I'm going to filter it to you. As you look at it as raw data, we're going to talk about what it might mean for you as you look at yourselves as a congregation. And as you look ahead to do the kind of stewardship and evangelism that is necessary for you to move yourself to the next iteration of who you're going to be. You don't want to give up who you are, but you want to build on that, grow from that to who you are going to be. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. I'm going to start with a bunch of maps and a bunch of information. I'm going to talk it through. At any time that you want to ask a point of clarity, raise your hand. Peter will interrupt me and we'll, we'll, we'll answer your question, okay? All right, here's the ground rules. Last, year, last time we started, we stopped with this Fran. Can you all see this Fran uh, thing in front of you that says F-R-A-N? This, yes, we can. Okay, this was a this was a um, um, acronym to talk about how you might do evangelism: friends, relatives, and neighbors. Okay. Now we're going to start with this, and this is the first one. It's it's under our name because we had to buy it under a church. But as you can see, whoops, here's where you're located on this map, um, and I want you to take a look at this area. It's mostly green with some splotches of blue and yellow. To your left there, you will see how those things uh, map out. You are in the middle, smack dab in the middle, of the richest area in Clark County. You can argue with me all you want about how poor you are and how poor your neighbors are, but statistically speaking, the richest area of Clark County. I say that out loud because most of us tend to believe that you're in this blue area right here. And if you'll notice up here to the left, that's New Carlisle in north. That is a very poor area. It's right smack dab in the middle. Springfield, which is almost all blue and yellow. You see, these are average household incomes. Now, average income means just that. If there's five people living in a house and you take all their incomes, that's a single household income. You average them out amongst all of the households there are in the area. That's the average. So this is not what people actually make, but rather what you can assume the average household brings in. And it's, it's not a matter for you to see dollars, but rather to see gradations. Who lives in your area? Your church is located in the highest concentration of wealth. Now, that may surprise you. It surprised me to find this out. It surprised me to find this out. The same thing is true of Good Shepherd in West Milton. It's also true of, um, uh, you would expect it to be true of us, uh, and it is to a certain extent, because we're located right down here below this red arrow, where this, where this bend is, right here. We're located in this next arrow down. You notice all around us it's green. That's Beaver Creek and, and the township, the Bath Township. And above us, right up to the line here, this is, this is Highway 40 here, okay? You're located right here off of Highway 40. But you are in the smack dab in the middle. And I'm going to back this up a little bit because I want you to see this again. This is the area that you're in. Boom. Now, the next map that they show us, where I say it's a graphing, is, is what they call generations. You need to know this because you need to understand how you relate to other areas. This line across the center would be called what we call the average or the baseline. If you were to take every area across every part of the United States and you would average it out, all right, where do you fall in, in relationship to that average? What you will see is in this area below survivors, which is 56 and below, you fall below the line. That means there are fewer people of this age bracket in your area. That's probably not a surprise for you to hear. 
The other night I was there with your, with your council talking about stewardship, and one of the things they talked about, we want to get younger people to church. Here's something you need to know. There aren't a lot of younger people living where you are. You're below the average. So when you focus your resources trying to drag younger people in the area, two things. Number one is you're trying to attract people that aren't there. And number two, you're competing with everybody else over the same people, which is a smaller number of people. These are just business realities, okay? Good, bad, or indifferent, that's not a judgment. But the reality is this. Here's where your reality is. You are 8.7% above the national average in terms of your boomers. That's 57 to 74. And 13, almost 14% higher for the silence. This probably is not a surprise to you. But here's what I would suggest. This mitigates where you put your efforts for evangelism. Don't believe for a second that these people need to be evangelized less or are numerically more represent, representational in church. It is not true. Uh, and we're going to take a look at a map that bears this out here in a little while. This is not true. Don't believe that everybody who is between 57 and 93 goes to church or affiliates with the church. They are no more likely to do that than people under those ages. And the difference is these folks speak your language. They were raised at a time when church was normative. They understand who you are and what you have to say. That should make your job easier, not harder. Here's the percentage of population. 30 to 49. That's the first group that we're going to look at. Once again, let's see where we're located. Boom, right here in the middle of this area. See how that is? Now, the yellow, as this goes down to yellow, we're, we're talking about smaller and smaller number. On both sides of the highway, and again, this should not surprise you, you have between 0 and 22% of the population between the ages of 30 and 49. That means that the younger people live in these areas that are red. See? To the south. Here is, a, is in, in Springfield area, to that part of it. And the blue. You are in a yellow area. That means you're going to skew to an older population. You have fewer younger people as a percentage of the, po of the population than the average area in America. The next one is the area is the, is the population 50 to 64. Now I want you to take a look at how the population changes. The 25 to 35 percent, that's the highest saturation. Again, look where you're at. Between the ages of 50 to 64, highest percentage. These are, these are young boomers, late bloomers. These are folks who were children. When we were when we were uh, children, they would have been children. Well, with us, some of us. I'm 63, so uh, you know your pastor's age. Okay, and this he's in the middle of this, and then his. But these these folks are uh, that's who they're relating to right now, uh, in that 50 to 64. That's your highest percentage. You can see 25 to 35 percent. That means one out of four or one out of three people that live in and around your church fall in the ages 50 to 64. It's a significantly large number of people. So part of the thing you think about when you're crafting a message to talk to them, what kind of language do you use? These aren't people that you're unfamiliar with. These are not foreigners. These are not some like culture that, you know, the, the ska generation, people that listen to contemporary music. No. At best, you can say these are folks that were raised with Bob Dylan. <laughs> okay, these are folk music people. You don't know who you're talking to. The youngest population, 18 to 29, I thought this might be interesting. Once again, the percentage the higher, the, the red, you are not as old as you think either. The yellow would be the very, very small population. The blue is right in the center, uh, probably close to an average, you would say. According to this, from 11 to 19 percent in the ages of 18 to 29. That's not an insignificant number of people, but it's not a large number of people. You can see right here, where the highway bends, this is right Patterson Air Force Base right here. <laughs> see where they skew? 18 to 29. And, and this is south. This is Riverside. Okay, here's where we're located right here. Okay, so we, we have, we have uh, apartments here. We're located right along the, this, this area right spot here. Here's where you're located. Okay. And the projected growth of population, this is important too. As they're looking ahead, how fast the areas grow. Now, I want to give you a comparison. Again, here's where we're located. The green, the checkerboard green, is the highest that's just south of I-675. I in other words, on the other side of the highway from us, uh, that is uh, not Beaver Creek, but Bath Township. They're expecting the highest. Right where we're located, it's in the, it's in the 5 to 10 percent range. These are, this is high growth area right here. You are located, boom, right here. Right on the border between minus 5 to minus 1 percent. 
and minus 1 to 1%. 1 That's very slow, stable growth uh, and, or negative growth. That means that what you've got is a, a lot of older people, and they're not expecting folks to move there. That may sound d discouraging, but don't, because that's pretty much typical of the whole United States right now. And as you can see, typical of huge swaths of the county, starting up here in Clark and going down into Green. This is Xenia in here, and then over here into the areas where you would see Cedarville and you know all those places are down in this area. Uh, and also all over here, Dayton, this all over here, Dayton, very, very negative growth. The only place we're seeing fast growth is up here. This is in the Troy West Milton area. And in Fairborn, around Fairborn, Green County, right around Fairborn, Beaver Creek, and between Zinia and Beaver Creek. And then up here north of Springfield. But there's one place here that nobody's paying attention to. Boom, right here. That is south of, or on the south side of Highway 40, uh, in the area that would include today Brant. Brant would be located right about here where my arrow is. So it's not outside of you, because we're only talking about five, six miles here. High growth area right here. And this is high growth, 10 to 13% growth, huge amount of growth. More growth than any particular church is probably going to be able to handle. You're in a slow growth area or in a very, what I call, stable area, right on the edge of it. Now let's take a look at educa education completed by adults. Again, this line in the center is the national average. In terms of grade school and high school, you fall below the national average as a percentage of your population. Some college and postgraduate way above. And college graduates a little bit below your normal here. So high school, college graduate, these are within I call norms or tolerances, but here, not many grade school schoolers. It's, again, you skew old, that's fine. But much better educated than the average county and area. Now, what that means for us as Lutherans, we tend to be cerebral in our worship. When we make the assumption that we have to dumb our worship down, or that we have to make it accessible to people uh, from some kind of intellectual, we're mistaking the people that live around our churches. You're not talking to the folks that are most uh, attracted and, and in sync with the message that you have. We need to start getting our heads right about this. The population may have changed. But it's not different, essentially, than it was 100 years ago. It's still better educated, older by, by, by nature, and wealthier than, than, the, than the population in the state around it. That's who you're talking to. That's the kind of people that Lutherans generally attract. So we need to go into this uh, activity not thinking that we're two strikes down on a three-strike game. That's not true at all. It's the opposite. We have three balls you know, toward a walk. We need to start thinking differently about how we approach it. Not being a self-defeating or thinking that there's nobody out there who will listen. No, they're out there. That doesn't make the job any easier, but it just means that we're not talking to an empty room. We're not talking to a bunch of empty suits. Real people out there are, are, are out there that will resonate with our message and will identify with our culture if we do it well and we get the message out. Here's another I thought was very surprising. The number of people who have or have been or are currently married in both of these areas above the national average. In fact, you have fewer singles. More and that means that there's that these are not young families; they're older families. That's that's the other thing we need to. So we these are have adult children, or their children moved out of the house. Moved out of the house. You're familiar with that. A lot of empty nesters. What does that mean? One of the things that it entails is that you you've got people living around you that are older marriage and empty nesters, they're at the times in their lives where they have the most disposable income, uh, which means you're not, you're not talking to poor people either. When you're out, when you're out dealing with, with folks that are poor and trying to craft your message for that, you're talking to the wrong folks. It's not that you shouldn't talk to them. You, of course you should. But when you don't talk to the folks who have, who have resources, who are married, who are in stable relationships, who value the values that we value, we're not talking to them. We're missing the boat. We have to start thinking differently about who we're talking to. And here's the one that I think that's very surprising. <laughs> you have heard it said, and I've heard it said because I've said it before, we have to change our worship style. We have to start being accommodating. You look around, you see all these contemporary worship churches that are blowing the doors off and they're growing so fast. Right. Let me suggest to you that part of that reason might be because, not because people prefer contemporary over traditional, because as this chart shows you, that ain't true. That ain't true. We, in your area, again, the national average, People who attend worship, or if they express a preference, you are 15 points above the average people wanting traditional worship. Six points above the average people who want both worship and temporary. One and a half points below the average. 
and 16, almost 15 points below those, the average on those who, who express no preference at all. So, do the math. When this is where we focus all of our attention, we are not even talking to the people around you. 45% of them either have no preference or are or amenable toward or actually have an active preference for traditional worship. That's who you are. You have to rethink who you are. Rethink how you do things. Uh, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a factor of quality, not style. But good worship attracts people. Bad worship repels them. Simple as that. So when you take a look at your worship life, don't think of it exclusively in terms of contemporary or traditional, because frankly, all worship is contemporary by, by definition. If you're doing it now, that's contemporary. Now, indigenous worship is a different category. Does, it, does the music style appeal to the folks around you? If I were doing, for example, indigenous worship in Fairborn, I would be doing more gospel music, more country and western style, more bluegrass style. Indeed, that would be if I wanted to, to attract those folks, but I'd have to also take a look at the other cultural realities. You know, does, does the cerebral style of worship, Lutheran worship, resonate with them? That's why we don't bother. Changing our music style doesn't change who we are or what we teach. It just doesn't. So we just do what we do as best we can. We tend to be right here in this both category, right here. We tend to, to do not completely blended, but we blend it a little bit so that we're not exclusively traditional. We would probably appeal to this group here, which is statistically the largest group. Those who like both of those who have no preference. We also appeal here. We are traditional. I think that's, that's something you'll have to look at as well as you look ahead. Now, here's the one chart that I really wanted to show you. Now, this is the one that, uh, that I think uh, really blows our assumptions out of the waters most. I've heard it said many times from people. Well, everybody that we know goes to church. Everybody that we know is a member of a church. Everybody that we know is already interested in church. So well, there's nobody left for us to talk to. Well, in a word, crap. That's just not true. Take a look at the map here. Again, here's where you're located. You're right smack dab in the area. According to this, 33 to 35%, that is one out of every three people that you talk to and work with and live beside, one out of three have no faith involvement. This is not people that used to be involved and are currently uninvolved, but have none whatsoever. Zero, zip, not a buckus. That's an a significantly staggering reality that we tend to overlook. We're out chasing people who already go to church when one out of every three people that we know don't have any faith involvement at all. They're not unchurched. They're non-churched. That significantly changes who we talk to and how we talk to them. And, and that's probably something you're going to have to train yourself to do because, frankly, we're not trained. Now, I would also point out that the statistics are is that half of the remaining don't go to church. They're, they're, they have involvement with their faith. By that, I mean they will express belief in God. They will express uh, some kind of nominal connection to a church. They just don't go. So it's not like there's nobody to talk to. But crafting your message for the two-thirds that have little or no faith involvement as opposed to the one-third that are somehow connected actively, that's what we're talking about. And those who have no faith involvement, that is an open field. You're not competing with anybody because there's nobody to compete with. They're, they have no faith involvement because they've had no conversations. They have no, see for the, they have no need. They see no need for it. Excuse me. These are the folks we have to craft toward. So as you craft an evangelist message going forward, this is part of what we have to keep in mind. Let's get a real closer look here. There you are. This blue area. Look at this, how vast this is. Now, right up here, this is the north, uh, northwestern side of Springfield. That's the heaviest concentration. And the yellow is the lowest concentration. Okay? So you are right here in the middle of this Midland, where one out of three, down here in the yellow around you, all these areas that are yellow, can be as high as one out of four. Or I'm sorry, uh, one, out of, one out of two. This one here is, is uh, the highest concentration right here. So these are, these are uh, how people respond to the... Um, uh, to the Census Bureau information. Uh, it's as accurate as it's going to be. There's no other information out there that, that confounds this or, 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 um, or argues with this. This is the information. All right. Now, I want to stop here and drink a, cup, drink a drink of my coffee and ask you if you have any questions or if there's anything you want to see again. Can you go back to the one that shows the legend? The what? The legend with the numbers on it, that one slide. This one here? Yeah, yeah. 38 to 43 is the red area. That's right up here. 20% is the lowest with no faith involvement, right? 
my back. I had it backward. You're right. Thank you. It's the yellow is the highest and the, and the red is the lowest. The highest faith involvement, the lowest faith involvement, red. You're right in the middle. One out of three is where you're located. Let me, let me, let me get that close again here. So the yellow are, are spots where there's high faith involvement. The red is the lowest, and you're right in the middle. Blue, blue is as you go to a shade. Solid colors are higher, and then you go into the shaded colors. That's, that's, that big yellow spot there is New Carlisle. Yep. And every church in New Carlisle is dying. <laughs> yeah, well, let's take a look at that, because right, you're right hip here, see? This is here you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now that is a high, that is not the highest, but the next the highest area of unchurched people. Uh, you might want to ask the question why they're dying. It's not because there aren't people there. It's not because there isn't a mission field there. It's it's a it's a more in, more intense mission field in the midst of a very intense mission field. This blue is the most unchurched. This is the next level. I'm sorry. Let me get this right here. Yeah, the other way. Right. The, 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 the yellow is, uh, the, yeah, it goes the other direction. I didn't get this straight. The darker the color, the higher the, in, the, higher the non-faith involvement. I'll go back again. So the lighter color. So this is, this, is a, this is a higher area of involvement. So that, I don't understand, so that means your churches aren't doing a very good job. It's not because people aren't expressing interest. It also may be that they're going someplace else to church, not in New Carlisle. That may be a statement of the quality of the churches in New Carlisle. So maybe maybe the one of the things you want to do is to is to go through and take a look at those churches and make a list of things not to do. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, let me get my uh, my my book open to the right spot here. We're going to look at some charts here um, that were made up by Percept. These are um, interpretive charts of some of the information we've looked at. And the first one is um, people in place. This, this again, compares your area to the, to the national averages. And there's five areas. Uh, projected population density, that is the number of people per square mile. Projected population change. Distribution, which means are they, are they scattered or, or are they you know, located in certain closer areas. The diversity. And diversity, by the way, is not about necessarily about race, that's one of the issues, but also about socioeconomic, uh, cultural diversity, and then the area dynamic level. Now, let me, let me explain. I, I looked all these up last time and I forgot. In the book that, um, that we gave to you, all of these things are defined in paragraphs. We're not going to go over that today. I'm going to hit the ones that, we, that are obvious. These other ones, like the area dynamic level, I'm not going to get into that. When you put a small group together to start doing evangelism planning, they need to look at these definitions and, and, and understand what they are. But right now, we're just talking about impressions, okay? So let's start at to the top one here. It says uh, projected population density. That is projected. They're expecting the density to increase. That is, you're going to go up. Generally speaking, that the area is going to go up. It's somewhat high now. They're expecting it to continue that way. Population density is uh, per square mile people. Projected population change, they're talking about being stable. So when you look at that negative 5 to, pos to, to 0 to 1%, they're actually looking at you to be close to that 0 to 1%, negative 1. So you're not going to have a major population change. People are it's not like someone going to pull the plug and drain the water. That's not happening. What you're seeing is probably like a very slow leak. Uh, whereas a stable, stable on the high side means they're expecting that to actually slightly go up. So looking at 0 to 1% growth, that's probably closer to what their expectations are for the next 10 years. Distribution, very dispersed. That shouldn't be a surprise to you. That means there's lots of empty space between where the people are living. Now, you see, that sounds different than per, per uh, uh, high population per square mile. Yeah, that's an average. You know, so if you have 20 people and there's 20 square miles, but they're all living in one spot, that's, that's, high, that's, uh, dis that's dispersed. Uh, and, it, and it means that there's a high density in one spot. They say you're very dispersed. That means that people are not living in communities. That's a problem. That means you may have to locate where these places are and focus your efforts in certain places. You can't go everywhere at once. So even knowing something about all the people who live around there, you still can't just go everywhere. You have to look at where they live, 
You have to know what their traffic patterns are, where they drive to work, where they drive to shop. All of those things are going to come into play before you start spending any resources that be time, talent, or treasures on any kind of evangelism. You need to know this stuff first. That's the homework you have to do. And the diversity, this is important, very high. Very high diversity. Again, I would go to your book and ask the question, what do they mean by diversity? Take a look, because you'll know your people uh, that you live around there better than I will. I mean, I can make, I can tell you about diversity in Fairborn, but what does it mean to be diverse uh, in um, in uh, New Car in uh, New Carlisle and and uh, Donaldsville in that area? I don't know. Uh, it may have something to do with race, uh, and I'm sure it does. But it may have more to do with socioeconomic diversity. It may have more to do with cultural diversity. For example, in Fairborn, we have Appalachian, non-Appalachian. That's a huge divide. We also have. Um, a large uh, African-American population that's increasing every day. When I first came here 25 years ago, it was less than 1%. Now it's, cl now it's close to 6%. That's still, not a, that's still not high on the national average, which is about 17%. But it's, if it's gone up six, it's gone up five times in the last 25 years. That's the factor. So we have to take a look at those things. The next uh, thing is uh, called the faces of that diversity, and they break it out. Now, these are only... Uh, they, six areas that they break it out. First of all, lifestyle groups, middle American. Uh, there's a definition, again, in your book for what all these things mean, but I think you know what middle American means. That means you're not dealing with people who are culturally different. They may be racially different, but culturally different, that's not the same thing. For example, in Fairborn, uh, we, run, we run up the same way. I can take a look in Fairborn and see cultural differences. We have a, a large number of Hispanics, a large number of Orientals, uh, uh, East Asia Pacific Islanders. We have a large number of, um, of African American, large number of Caucasian. There is greater diversity in the Caucasians than there is between the Caucasians and those other groups. Why? Because they all share the same lifestyle. Middle American, because the Air Force Base. They're retired Air Force people. And so they're, they just they have a different culture. You have to know about your community. Non-Anglo population, it's somewhat low. Like These are by national averages. It may be high compared to your, your experience past experience, here you can see the fastest racial ethnic growth, Hispanics and Latinos. And that's not a surprise. Up in the New Carlisle area, you know that's a large growing population. How big it is, whether it requires special attention, that's something that cannot be determined by looking at statistics. You have to go out and actually look at that community. They may be over-serviced or under-serviced, we just don't know. But it does tell you to go down to the next one, generations, what's the largest generation? The boomers. The boomers is the biggest generation between 57 and 74. If you're, if you're spending all your time learning about millennials like every other church, you're wasting your time because that's not the people who live around you. You need to learn about the boomers. And trust me, we're pretty complex and stupid, so it takes a lot of, there's a lot to learn. Family structure is mixed. Uh, that means while a traditional would be somewhat to very uh, traditional, uh, you, you have a, they have a high regard for marriage, but that does not mean that... Um, uh, that they are any different, you're right in the middle. That means that you you reflect the national reality. Your culture is not different from the national culture. But that means that if you were going to buy a program off the shelf, at least in terms of family structure, it might work for you because it would be it would be cutting toward the averages. Finally, on the education, again, this always surprises people that live in Ohio. You are you are somewhat high. You're above the norm. You're dealing with a more educated crowd. When I look at this picture, Middle American. Somewhat low on the on the Anglo American population, um, boomers, mixed families right in the middle, and somewhat high on the education. This would be the demographic description of the average Lutheran, and I'm telling you the truth. This is who we are. Why aren't the Lutherans? Why do the Lutherans not have a bigger footprint in your county? That's the question that you need to answer. Why don't you have a bigger footprint? There's a lot of reasons for that, but it's not because the people aren't there. That's not true. So we need to start talking about how we can bridge the gap between our expectations and our actions. Community issues, this is showing for you what are considered the, the three highest levels. Uh, the risk level in the center, I'll talk about that for a second. Um, but these are their, their, um, their, com their um, conclusions. People, hopes and dreams. Now take a look at the five areas. Basics, what they mean, basics. Family problems and community problems. You may have individuals or you may have places where you live where these are higher of concern. But here's the, here's the area that, you're, that the survey said is the, is the most common uh, espoused 
hopes and dreams. People are looking for aspirations. They're looking for future. They're looking for visioning. They're looking for uh, a place to move toward and onward uh, and spiritual, personal. It's, uh, so you guys fall into the hopes and dreams. You just got to know that when you talk, start talking about your message. It's not the Christian message it deals with all of these things. But where you're going to focus, saying is if you want to focus to people who, who, are, who are trying to hear some word, this is, where they're, this is where most of them are listening. The risk level, the, str the, the, the stress conditions, that is, the economy, the politics. Now, this was taken before last year's election, so we have to, uh, we have to somewhat, uh, to somewhat uh, mitigate this by that. But, but you know, uh, it, it still probably is basically true. Uh, the socioeconomic conditions, uh, people's, the community conditions, uh, are they high, are they low, are they average? Somewhat low. What that means is that people's anxiety level is less in your area than they are in other areas around you. Move into Springfield, that would go to the somewhat high. Move into Dayton, it would go into the very high because the, 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 the culture around them just increases that. So take a look at your definition under C2 in the, in the manual, risk level. It gives you all of the factors, but you are in the somewhat low. Uh, and then finally, potential resistant to change. This probably won't surprise you. Somewhat high. The older the population, the wealthier the population, the more the more angle of the population, the higher the resistance to change. Now, the question still begs, do you need to change? That's something you can only answer for yourself. But if you choose change as one of the uh, as one of the goals, short term or long term, understand you're going to be dealing with somewhat high resistance to it, both within your community and within your church and within yourselves. That's just who you are. And faith preferences. Now, th again, this is this is um, shows you basically what your averages are. First of all, you can describe faith receptivity. Are people open or closed? You're in the average. You're no different than the other community around. Financial support. Are people more or less inclined? Again, right in the middle. Your average. What this means is no special advantages, no special problems. You don't need to invent something new. You don't need to deal with something new. You are like every other community in every other place in this regard. And also at the bottom, have a religious preference. Again, right? Your average. But here's the two things that you might want to keep in mind. Church style. We talked about this already. You are in the somewhat traditional side. Anytime you move off of this center line, which is both, to this, this is significant. If you were on this side of it, it would also be significant. This is about your worship style. It's about your your structure, about who you are, about your theology, your doctrines, all the things. It is not, you are not disabled by who you are. Uh, I have spent most of my career apologizing for being a Lutheran. You do not need to do that. This is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation for the love of God. We should be crowing like, 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 crow, like, um, like roosters. We're, we're not saying a lot. This, people are interested. They are, they are resonant with traditional uh, styles of churches. You're not dis, dis, disadvantaged. But here, you may be. What is it that people are looking for in your area? Look here, recreation. So, it is no, you know, your pastor can tell you that Epiphany, before they blew up uh, in 09, uh, they, they opened up a whole new plant in Springboro. I drive by it every time I go to visit my, my second daughter. Uh, and it is a church on the grounds with with uh, volleyball nets behind and baseball fields out there and, um, and, and all kinds of things. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a sports complex because they read the tea leaves uh, after the last sentence. This is what they wanted. Now, they are dealing, they are attracting a large number of younger people in that particular spot. But the only ones who are staying and joining are folks that are reflective of these realities here. This may get them in the door, but these are the things that keep them. Faith receptivity, financial support potential, church style, and religious preference. That's what keeps them in. You may live in an area where when people respond what they need, they're saying recreation. They probably, given that you skew to the boomer side, and now I'm speaking my personal opinion, they're probably not talking about softball leagues and volleyball leagues and golf leagues. They might. They might mean that, but that's probably not what they mean. What they're looking for is a safe place to go and to, and to, and to get away from the humdrum, the, break, the brokenness. This is what churches, Lutheran churches, used to do regularly. You would have, you know, you'd have a game night. You'd have a, you'd have a potluck. You'd have all these things on a regular basis. You'd have a whole group that planned these things and put them on for your, for your congregation. They're suggesting here is that maybe there's something the community needs to be 
uh, made aware of you need to take more uh, in, that you'll make inroads to where people are saying they have a need because they're more isolated than ever uh, the technology is, has put them in communication with each other but not made them less isolated from each other but they're looking for a place where they can gather that's the advantage of having a brick and mortar uh, church right in the center of a place where recreation is considered now finding the right formula that's still hard work but it does mean that you've got an advantage now uh, you might want to think as <laughs> As you develop your property in the future, right now you're you're you got all your property under you know you're, you're cropping it out, and that's okay, but you may want to think in the future whether that's the best thing in the long term to serve your community. Uh, so as you look to develop your 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 property in the future, you might want to think about maybe putting in a, a softball uh, or not a softball but a, a volleyball net and a sand volleyball. Maybe that's something you want to look at. I don't know. You want to find that out, but but be open to that. Recreational golf leagues, you've got golf courses in New Carlisle. I mean, there's things you can do. Think about these things. What can you do to organize people? Uh, and I might point out to you that you're in partnership with a church that has a freaking gymnasium available. And, and that's open to you and for your use. So if you're looking to do something that, like get a basketball team or a volleyball team together, that's something that can be done without you having to worry about renting a place or finding a place within driving distance. We have one. All right. Which we don't use for those things, by the way. We don't use those. Um, people in place detail. I'm going to skip this one. You can look at this one another time. Um, yeah, I, I didn't do these with the other group. I don't think I broke out. I'm getting all of these out. Sorry. All right. Okay. Taking a break here. By the way... <laughs> Which general church programs or services are most likely to be preferred in the area? And, and they gave you the choices. Day schools, divorce recovery programs, marriage enrichment, sports and or camping programs. Uh, as an overall category, or to recreation are the most significant based upon total number of households. And so you had 40% of the households. And that reflects the nation, which is 38%. You have, this is that you're very typical in this. 40% of the people who responded are looking for sports and or camping programs or recreational ways. Now, this is not a way to evangelize people. It's a way to get their attention. Understand that. And there is nothing wrong with it. As long as you understand how it works in the larger scheme of things and you're faithful to what you're called to be and to do, there's nothing wrong with this. So, uh, I know that people like to, to, to go to get away from it, but that's, that's not it. All right. Um, Questions or comments? Well, all I can think of is we can paint hopscotch on our driveway over here on the side. And I have two poles and we can make a badminton field. But we need to have flyers or something to hand out why it's available or... You know, keep in mind, and that's fine. Keep in mind you're talking, you're talking both short term and long term. Okay. Long term is what can you do in three to five years. Uh, and, and, and short term is what you can do in the next three to five months. So uh, when we do evangelism programs, the first thing you do is you say, okay, here's our long term goal. And so uh, if you wanted to uh, develop your property for, um, uh, to include some kind of a recreation, well, first of all, you can do that right now without disrupting what you're already doing, which has value. You don't, you don't tear things down to build some that do work to build something that might work. But you want to know, so you go out and you, and you um, ask your community, you ask your people again. When you start getting people into your, to your church, you're doing evangelism, you're talking with them, you're interfacing with them one-to-one, -one, it may be that one of the things you want to have conversation about is, what do you, what do you see, how, what would you like a church to provide as, as an institution that we're not providing right now? Uh, you know, you're feeding the hungry, you're doing worship, you improve those things, you make those things better. That's something you do right now. But, but, but when you add something in, you have to ask, what do we do? Because you've got to put your money, your effort, your resources towards something. It has to be not just something you're interested in or you'd like to do, but something that, that is um, a good, as a good steward uh, will, will bear benefit. Uh, and so I say, if you decide you want to, for example, put in a bad minimum, well, you can do that tomorrow if you want. Because uh, you've got a property over on the right that's underutilized. Now, whether you'd want to do that or not, it's a different, different issue. But you can do that. But there has to be some program attached to it, some rationale something like yeah uh, we're going to develop this and we're going to do a, a league in the community and we're going to sign people up and we're, or we're just going to have a day or whatever i don't know but it can't be a one-shot event because you're looking at changing a culture if the people living around say we're looking for recreation this may be something you may want to start well next spring and you want to do something that'll, that'll last the spring 
And then you're going to have more things that will happen during inside the building. And you may have to change the way you use your building. You know, and so right now, for example, you walk in your fellowship hall, there's tables and chairs up all the time. So that hall can only be used for one thing, eating. Now, you know in your head you can take everything down and move it. But somebody walking in there doesn't know that. For all they know, that's, those, those tables and chairs are up that way all the time. I understand why they're up that way all the time. Because when you use your hall, you use it almost exclusively, well, not, not exclusively, but almost primarily for eating. And you don't want to tear them up and take them down every week. I get that, see. But when you're going to start thinking about how you use the building in the future, that's part of what you have to consider. Because that's work you have to do. You have to have a reason for people coming in, something planned for them to do, people actually doing it, the room being changed. The one thing I'll say about abiding Christ, this is not make a, it's not a resource issue. As I, I said I've become an expert at tearing down and setting up tables. I'm sure Pastor Peter has too. That's not the point. i got a reason to do it. We've got, got folks who come in and do it for us. Uh, they they want to use the building for Zumba. You can do that in your building. Zumba is an easy thing to do. You know, you find somebody who will teach it, you give them the room for free, and people come in. But then what do you do with the people? Do you inter interface with them? We got our people to come in, and our, the guy who led it, who eventually joined our church, said, well, you know, I'm going to do holiday Zumba, and I'm going, to collect, I'm going to collect canned goods for the pantry. And so we put a table up, so instead of paying for that, you put canned goods on the table. And, and so right away people come into the Zumba, which is a, which is a leisure activity, and they go, hey, uh, we're helping the community here. Also, we, we put up commercials. <laughs> uh, we have the, they use our, our, our fellowship hall. We have those screens. We run commercials. This is what Zumba did. They, did, they, they raised money for it. We put that up there. That's part of our Abiding Christ uh, outreach, see? They see themselves in our outreach. We put, uh, they walk by our door. They're, they're walking by flyers that talk about our program. Uh, our worship services. My kids, my people, they go and do Zumba. They interact with them. They invite them. So you see, this is all part of a larger strategy. All we did was open the room. That's all we did. Found somebody would do it. And they said, hey, we'd like to do it. Great, do it. We're in charge of nothing. They ended up tithing 10% of what they took into the church. That helped us too. But we didn't do it as a revenue stream. That was a secondary concern. These are the way you think. Think in terms of evangelism. What you can do to interact with the people. First get them in the door and then start to... Con to not convert them is probably not the right word, but have conversation with them. And, if, and some of them join. Some of them join. Some of them become part of your system. But they see the Zumba people here, and there's about 25 to 40 of them on any given week. They already see themselves as part of our extended system. They bring food in to feed the, the pantry through Abiding Christ Lutheran Church. They, and when people say, gosh, I'm looking for a church to go, they go, hey, I, I do Zumba at a church. They themselves may not be a member of the church. They, they recommend people to come to our church. That's how you do it. That's one little instance where all they did was open the doors. Now, somebody has to open the doors. Somebody has to lock the doors. Somebody has to be in charge of that. That's, so that requires different kind of planning. But that's the kind of changing the culture of who you are. It doesn't require anything but a little effort. Now, whether a Zumba is something you need or not, I can't tell you. But that's certainly one way of doing it. It's a very low risk, low investment kind of a thing that can, that can start, to, start to turn the ship around. Okie doke. You're either gobsmacked or whatever. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a look now at, um, at some of the details. And we're looking at uh, what I call evangelism outreach. And now we're going to be looking at some, some nutsy, boltsy stuff. And these are the areas that we're going to be looking at. And by the way, um, I got in that book that I gave to Linda, there are some concrete things to do that, that I'm not going to review here. Um, but I am going to talk about two general things. First is attracting guests, getting them in the door. And the second is greeting them. That is, once they are there, what kind of an experience do they have? I guess three things. And the third is, once they're moving from being a guest to the orbit of, of discipleship, membership, how do you how do you assimilate them into your yeah. that is not easy with what you, you have a single cell church that's not as easy as it as it, it sounds I've mentioned this to you before um, even folks that are familiar with your system but are not part of it find your system somewhat challenging because you all know each other so well and you are very friendly by the way I, I don't want you to get you really are genuinely a friendly group of people you smile genuinely you welcome people genuinely you don't overwhelm folks when they come in. You really are good at what you do. Know that, okay? But the things you don't do well, you just suck at. 
And I, and I think that you need to have somebody who loves you to point, point these things out. And here's one example. You, have, you, you go to the effort to put uh, your, uh, your um, worship service up on the screen, which you all know what's coming next. So you all know what's coming next. You know the next slide is just a picture, but you know what's supposed to be. But if you're from outside your system, you have no idea what's coming next. None. And nothing is more off-putting in worship than to not know what's happening. Uh, and so I, I suggested this to you one point. You need to start thinking about just putting out an order of worship, you know, like even a, even a baseball game, they let you know what the batting lineup is, you know, so people don't have to guess. Uh, and you know, you know, which the team. Basic information. You have a tendency because you know each other so well to say, well, we don't need to know this. We're going to waste our time <coughs> and our efforts putting this information on paper. We know this. Yes, you do. But, this, but, but, but the message that you're giving is, and unless you know it as well as we do, you don't belong here. And I know that's not the message you want to communicate. So, attracting guests, responding to guests, tools and resources, we'll talk about that. New member assimilation, step by step. How do you get people to move from visiting once to actually deciding they want to become part of your system? Tracking your attendance, that's a job. And even if you only have a few number, and I can tell you everybody was in church today, you can say, that's great. Can you tell me if they were in church two weeks ago? How about two months ago? How about their attendance over the last six months? Is it spotty? Is it good? Is it solid? If you don't know the answer to those questions, you need to. And in fact, there's no excuse for a small church not to know that. I know it. And if I don't know it off the top of my head, I can look it up. Because when I get done with you today, I'm taking attendance. I'm going to be checking off everybody was here, taking a list of all the, uh, the guests who were here, and making sure they've been contacted. That's what you do. And that has to be the, the responsibility of a group of people. Uh, it can be a pastor, but, but I think it's better to have people who are responsible for it and know what they're doing. Then, uh, then these last three areas, we may talk about those if we get to them today, but those are going to be basically about, those, all those samples are in your book. Uh, I, I'm saying that today because of the, the changing of the culture. Now, this is true in my church. It may not be true in yours, but because of the changing of the culture, people are simply not home to be visited, and they don't really appreciate this. They find it to be intrusive. But that doesn't mean they don't want to be contacted. Getting their emails or sending them a note, that's an effective way. Phone call will work. Some people, and I think it probably skews to the, the older they are, and I mean by older, I mean if they're past 70, they will, they will appreciate a visit. But I'm 63, and i got to tell you, the last thing I want is anybody knocking at my door for any reason, unless they're family or friends they have been invited. I just don't want them. Uh, I'm always suspicious. I was raised that way. You know, I'm a salesman, so I, I don't like it. When folks knock on my door, they're trying to shovel my walk, mow my lawn, sell me windows. <laughs> it's just not fun. Uh, that's been my experience. So, you know, you know who you're talking to, know your culture, and figure out the best way to do it. But it's not... Ne this does not necessitate groups of people going out and you know in twos and threes and knocking on doors. That's how Jesus did it. We we have different me methods and 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 uh, means. So let's start first of all by attracting first time guests. Um, there are I got hold on a second. I got to get my uh, sheet up. Anybody have any questions while we're talking about this? Uh, let me just talk in general first before I go to these details. There are three kinds of, of assimilation that are practiced today. Uh, the first kind of assimilation is none. <laughs> People walk in, they walk out, uh, you don't even know they've been there. Um, uh, there's nothing that's ever done to ask people to join. Um, there's, no, there's no plan to get them from first time in the door to, to standing in front of the altar to, to the nothing. Uh, the second kind is to have like where you get a group of people, you identify them, you nurture them, you inculcate them, you have a membership class. And a membership class is uh, where you do, you know, two, three, four, five weeks of let's talk you through. We'll assume you know nothing. We're going to educate you. The the third kind of evangelism is, the, and this is the kind I'll be, I'll be right up front. I prefer is is the is the Celtic kind of evangelism, which is where you have a system, and you have a and you have a intentional way of asking people to stay with you. So that can be coffees. That can be <clears throat> that can be studies. <clears throat> that can be potlucks, but you are inviting people to stay, or you have something going on that's not on Sunday, uh, and you might have something as simple as coffee with the pastor once a month. You So somebody comes on the third week of the month, and, and um, the fourth week is, is where the pastor's going to stay for 20 minutes, and he's just going to meet new people. Now, you're not going to do that right away, but you're going to eventually, you're going to have folks that come. Once you start inviting them in, 
you you may have the pastor and the council president sit down with them, or pastor and one of your leading members makes no difference. Where they just come and just say, "Tell me about yourself. I'll tell you about myself." You start with a conversation, and and uh, in a small system like yours, this is the least intimidating, and and the most effective way uh, to go. We do it here that way. We have coffee with the pastors. When I get a group of people together, I don't invite them to a membership uh, a membership class first. I invite them to have coffee with me between services or after service. Just we'll, we'll sit a table up here, put a sign up, pastor's coffee. Come in and we just sit down with a cup of coffee. Tell me about yourself. Tell me who you are. Occasionally if they show up for an after uh, church event, I beeline for them and I sit down. I don't care what else is going on. Tell me about who you are. Tell me what brought you here. Tell me about yourself. No, tell me about, you know, you're at a you're Lutheran church, you know what you're in for. Just conversation. Just open that up. I'm not particularly good at that. But it's important that you do that. You're creating a, a relationship. And then invite them to something else. So um, I would say is that the uh, emphasis is no longer on membership but on relationships. Okay? So advertising, there's a variety of ways to do that. I think that... Um, uh, that the most effective way is social media. It is effective. It is pervasive. If you don't have a social media page, you should develop one and you have some, somebody in charge of it. It should have something new on it every week. It doesn't have to be church-related. It can just be here's a meme or a, or a cartoon or whatever. Um, John and Marge, you're, you're putting out a, a lovely newsletter. Probably those cartoons, uh, they find their way to my Facebook page. Uh, and people, I mean, I'll get, if I, the last cartoon I put out from you, I forget what it was, um, but I had like 350 people click on it. They liked it. Uh, and they're not all members. See? They, they will associate that kind of thing with your congregation. And then when we advertise, uh, you know, this is the event coming up. Uh, I'll spend $5 of my money or $5 church money. That's the kind of advertising you put out. And I'll, I'll reach two, three, 400 people through my Facebook page. Uh, I suspect you, you you may not reach that many. You might not reach 25 or 30. It doesn't matter. Uh, you'll reach more that way than you would in a newspaper. Uh, so that kind of uh, think about what you're putting on. First, you get in the habit of looking at your page, and then you start getting the habit of, of two, three, four, five, six times a year uh, spending $5 to push out or to promote a specific event. So you have an event coming up on the 5th of August, uh, The uh, and you want that to, to go out. I would suggest that you do two things. One is is that you, uh, you you set it up on your Facebook page. Uh, with your, If you don't have a credit card, get somebody who has one that could, that'll sign up for that. And um, and spend $5 to push it out. And then also ask ask us to do it. They will, you know, we'll, let's put it out for your thing for $5. And, and you'll be surprised the number of people will get that. It won't do any harm at all. Once you get them there, though, you have to have a plan for how to interface with them. That means you have to have something, you're going to give them away, a, a tchotchke or some kind of a, of a, of a, a, a doodad or something. It has your name and your address on it. Uh, brochures are not that effective, better than nothing, but not that effective because people don't read brochures anymore. You know, they wipe the ice cream off their car seats with them and throw them away. That's what they use them for. Uh, but an effective, colorful brochure is better than nothing. Uh, probably something small like a business card would be better. Uh, here's our worship service and times. Here's our pastor's name and his phone number. Boom. That's all you need. Uh, if there's an event coming up on the back of it, say, and coming up in, you know, September, our, our first big whatever it is, you know, coming up. Uh, and if you don't have something that you can put on the back of the card, invent something. Plan something. That's what you need to do. Start having events that you can always look ahead to. You, you got Christmas and you got Christmas Eve and Easter. Those are those are already on the on the calendar. But um, you know, there's something you're doing with with um, uh, with LSIM, you can you can advertise, but you want to advertise the things that you're doing in your place, uh, and and because uh, you want them to come to your place. So think about what you can do two three events a year uh, that are scattered throughout your calendar. Build toward those things and start inviting people to come. Uh, responding when they show up. When anybody shows up at your door, you should have a plan for how you're going to contact them. Uh, that, sh that can be an email. It can be a postcard. You have to gather information in and be intentional about it. It doesn't happen by accident. Don't expect them to sign that stupid book by the door. A, they don't see it. B, they're not going to put their name into it. There's not. That's, that's 1950s thinking. Throw the book away. They're no good at all. Uh, have a way to interface with them in the worship time, either through an individual or through um, you know, a, 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 a pad or something. I don't know what. But try and find some way to gather information from visitors right then and there or in a small system like yours, 
have somebody who's assigned to meet and greet them as they as they leave, not as they come in, as they leave. Because when you come in, everybody wants to shake their hand. But when they leave is when you really want them. You want the last thing that they have uh, to be. And so it's like, hey, we're glad you came today. Did you get a chance to sign the, the book? And say, Would you mind sharing your email? We'd like to send out some information about next week. They'll tell you. They'll say, no, nah, I'm not that interested. Okay, fine. And I'll say, oh, yeah, sure. Here it is. If you don't, that last word they get going out the door is the most important word they hear. Thank you for coming. Hope you'll come again. That's what they have to hear. Use of banners, you do this, you've got a nice location. Your location, location, location is everything. You have a great location. You need to take advantage of it. You have a sign out front that does that does not change. I don't recall. Peter, does your sign change out front? Yes. But it's not electronic. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Uh, because they're driving through town doing 35 miles an hour, it doesn't have to be electronic, but it does have to be big. So you may need to say, here's here's... There you have to have event. Don't put too much information on your sign. But all make sure that you have something on your sign that people can read and respond to. Uh, make sure that if you've got a website, it's always on your sign at the bottom every time so people can see that. Direct people from your website to your Facebook page. Don't try and put Facebook information on the sign. It's too hard to, to advertise. But, uh, but um, you know, always have. So make sure you make good use of signs and occasionally cover with a banner. Put a banner out there and change it up, something in color. This, again, is something that we can do for you and with you. We have a guy that makes banners. If you have recurring in things, in particular like Christmas Eve and Easter, you should have banners hanging out in front of your place. You live in Donaldsville. There's no city codes to deal with. <laughs> you can put banners everywhere uh, and until they tell you you can. Uh, that's what I always say. Get, get banners out there. It really in, in effect, in ex, inexpensive way, effectively of, of getting drive by and walk by people to see that something is going on. Also, when they see a brick church that's closed 75% of the time or 80% of the time, it's locked up with no lights on, the message that you're sending is nothing's happening here. Move along. If you have banners that are coming out, you're, you're doesn't make a church is all closed down dark. The banner tells you something's coming up. That's important, so make use of banners, even if it's something as banal as, we love you, come to church on Sunday. It doesn't make any difference, but change it out. There should be a host and hostess at, at your, you've got a challenge because you have two main doors that people come in. You should have people at both of those doors, and I don't mean doors your sanctuary, because people have to walk through your fellowship hall to get to your sanctuary. If they park on that end, now it's very hard to see which door you come into. You need signs, wayfaring signs they call them. Entry, <laughs> put it on, you know, something you can put in your <clears throat> entry with an arrow, you know, at both ends of your building. A, lets people know where to come in. B, it lets people know you're open for business. You can take those signs down when you're not in it, but put them up there. So when people park in your parking lot, they don't have to guess what door to go in. Because right now, that's what they have to do, have to guess. Now, your building's not that big and complicated. I'm not trying to make this harder than it is. But anytime you put something, you're, you're, you're assuming people will figure this out. You're assuming that it's not important enough for them to know, and that's what they hear. They're not important. That's what they hear. And you don't want them to hear that. You want to eliminate every possible barrier to get them to the door. After that, you've got, you've got some pretty good product. <clears throat> but a host or a hostess is one way of doing it. Now, you don't have a big narthex. Your, your, your front door is really problematic. What I'm going to say is that you probably need to make better use of your space. You've got like this little room off to the right as you walk in. That's, that's used as kind of an overflow area. And here's my suggestion. Put a welcome desk in there. Set it up. So when people walk through, they're not going to that little table on the left where all the stuff is stacked up and everybody's standing in that little narrow spot. No, you're going to have it all to the right when they come in. You're going to have somebody there to welcome them. Say, here's the bulletin for today. Pick one up as you come in. Here's, here's the newsletter, if you haven't picked one up yet. Here's the newsletter. Welcome to the church here. Glad to have you with us. Would you sign in here? Train these people to, to interface at the door. At the other door, you'll have somebody who does that. You, might, you have a table there, I know, as you walk in. Just have the same information there, and it's the same thing. They're greeting people there. They're shaking their hands, saying, welcome to the church. Did you get a bulletin? Get us. Start. Don't have ushers and greeters. Your space is too complicated for that. Make it easy. Have one person do both jobs. Everybody else can be sitting in there and greeting and smiling, but have one person doing that job at both of the doors. And that's this well, well defined and well purposed welcome and hospitality center. Anytime you want to put in, push information out to your congregation or to do it at the welcome center, make that the hub. 
make everybody go to the same place. Your people, other people, I don't care what their old patterns are. You want to grow, you have to change the culture inside. That means that one of the small changes people have to make, and I talk about being resistant to change, they're going to have to go to that front door with a welcome desk is to pick up stuff. It's okay. Even if they come in the back door, they can walk that extra 10 feet once. It will not kill them. But if you get people going there, two things will happen. Number one is that you'll create that, that kind of grand central station of information. It'll become the place where everybody knows to go. And second of all, at the end of the service, you'll have the people all going to that place, coming and going. You'll welcome new people there. You have this opportunity. I would put my coffee there. Have coffee at that at that counter. And I know, I know, people don't like to have coffee in their sanctuary. I get it. But you can still have coffee there for for newcomers when they come in. Maybe there, if there's a way behind it to have a, a like a little table and chairs where people can sit, that'd be fine too. Like a little cafe area it doesn't have to be a. You're not trying to open a cafe, but a place where people can sit and chat before service. Right now, they all do it out in the fellowship hall. The problem with that is that is that it, it's um. And there's nothing wrong with that, actually, but uh, you, you should have it, uh, two places where people can do that. Because if folks come in the front door and they walk in and everybody else is in the fellowship hall, what do they see? They see an empty room. There's no way for them to know, whether, am I the only person here today? You know, They don't know that. So you gotta you got to start thinking as, as a guest would think. <laughs> We've already talked about the use of the census information. Okay. When we talked about... Uh, Well, let me go back here to, the, to say a few words about each of these things, advertising. First of all, church pages are the least effective. You might as well burn your money. Nobody reads church pages any, anymore but church people, and, and even they don't read them anymore. Uh, newspapers are no longer the biggest bang for the buck. They just aren't. Uh, that doesn't mean you should never use them. If you have a big event coming up, you should use everything, including the newspaper. But for regular, um, for regular information, email, number one, and... Um, and social media, number two. Those are the two biggest bang for the buck. When you get people's email, you have a way of contacting them. They can delete the email. And they don't like trash emails, but they can delete them. Um, so you don't send them everything, but you you know, you know can you can target them. And you can send things that you hope they might be interested in. Uh, the social media, that's even better. Because once you get on their social media page, if you're sending out stuff every week, you're reminding them that a rise in Christ still exists. They're doing something. And, if, and, if, and every now and then, they'll see something that they're interested in. Make sure you understand how to use your social media page, how to do events where people can respond to them, your, your people as well as others. This takes time. We've been doing it for years. We're still learning how. But it is the most effective way to do it. So uh, don't, uh, don't lose it. So email and social media, those are best. And web page is your third. Think of a web page as a brochure at a truck stop. Uh, <laughs> You know, people go to a truck stop and they're traveling. Uh, they might go to pick up the what's what's new in your area brochure, you know, or or a, um, a roadside stop, you know. Uh, you, you pick up the brochure. That's what your website is like. Now, internally, your website is probably one of your better tools. People will go to that, check your calendar. They'll go to your website to check events. They'll go to your website to check uh, staff information, how to contact. They might go to your, to your website to, to email the pastor. That's all fine. But for evangelism, it's not the first stop. The website for advantages will be somebody does a Google search and they go to the Arising Christ website. Right there on that front page, you better have a way to get them to some place that gives them current information. They're not going to figure out how to read your newsletter. They're not going to figure out how to find your calendar. That's why you should have the first thing on your, on your website would be click here for Facebook. They know Facebook. Boomers are big on Facebook. In fact, that's your biggest group that uses Facebook. It's not kids. It's boomers. So that's who you're, that's your advertisement. They'll click onto that. And they'll go to you, and that's where all your information will be. This is what's going on this week. This is a copy of the sermon. This is you know the the, the, the video for the sermon. All of that can be made available on Facebook. Any special music, you know, start learning how to get all that stuff onto Facebook. Have a have a YouTube account. They're free. You can upload your sermons into a YouTube account, and then you can send people out the link and, by their email. So here, here's this week's sermon. They don't have to go someplace and find it. Right there on their on the email they get, here's the link. They click on it, it goes directly to YouTube, and they're playing on whatever medium they're on. Start learning how to use those things. This is an example of a very complicated check uh, check card. Um, the purpose for this is to say, what are you trying? What do you want to know from the people that come? What is the information that you want them to have? 
we we have we we use the kiss principle keep it simple stupid so we want to we all we want is their name and their email we might we might want from a from a visitor some other kind of information uh, see all this stuff here on the right first time returning listen in your system you're going to know this they don't have to check this if if they've been more there more than once you're going to know now as you get larger this might be information you add to it but you don't need it right now um, but would like to know more about the church? Okay, maybe that's what you want to like a visit. Okay, new resident. I don't know. You know, these are the kind of things. Look at this. You don't need to guess what their age group is. What difference does it make? If they have children, you're going to know that too. I suspect I learned about this church from, that might be information you want to know. Keep it simple though. Phone numbers, people don't like to give their phone numbers out. They just don't. Notice this one has no place for an email address. We've learned that rarely will people give a phone number out. The only time they give a phone number is if they don't have an email. If they want you to contact them, they'll give you an email or a phone number. So I would say email slash phone number is what you want. Name. Now, unless you plan on sending them something, even the address is not that important, but okay. It's no con. Most of the time, when you put a let's get acquainted card or a, or a welcome card, you have to train everybody to fill one out. Because if they pass them up and down the pew, and they get in the hammer going, eh, they know I'm here, passing it on. I'm a member, nothing here for me. So what we do with ours is we also have volunteers. So you have the, the fifth coming up. We need you to volunteer for this shift, this shift. Put it on this card. We'll, we'll volunteer for this shift. We'll volunteer to help sell hot dogs. We'll volunteer to help price goods. We'll volunteer to help move things. We'll volunteer, whatever. You know, get that on that card and have them check it. So that everybody has a reason to stop and put their name on that card. Get people in the habit of filling out this card so that when the visitor shows up, they're not the only one the whole building is doing this card. Everybody's doing it. It's important that you do that. So develop the card and then get everybody in the habit of using it. At your welcome desk, there has to be tchotchke, some kind of a, you know, a way of getting people to remember you. This is somebody's way, you know, we've done all this stuff. We've done, we've done welcome brochures, we've done cups, we've done uh, magnets, we've done, some of these things can be done fairly inexpensively. Um, if you're looking for something that's interesting, if you have an idea, collaborate with your partners in LSIM. We have resources, people who do these things, for example, for a living, they will do them for cost or perhaps even, you know, we can, we can work with you uh, and put something together. Uh, but, but always think about in terms of what can we hand out to folks? What can we give to folks? Now, you're going to have, we have between uh, 15 to 30 visitors a week. By visitors, I mean people who are non-members. New ones, mm, like everybody else, we might have one or two a week. I had, for example, today I think I had three visitors. They're, they're new to us. So that's the folks that I would target. I had 240 people today. Three of them were first-time visitors. Probably about 30 of them are non-members that are in some some status between regular visitor and, and membership. They may never join. I don't know. We've always had that number. You may only need to have, you may only do, in a month, you might have one or two or three visitors. So you're not talking about a heavy investment, but you should have a way that you hand them out. Thank you for coming. Here's a gift. This is more about, and, and put inside whatever you're going to hand out, information about who you are and what you do. And, and you need to think about it. If you can't fill out a brochure that says, here's who we are and what we do, you've got some programming issues to deal with. Here's some banners, ideas, Christmas blessing, welcome to the community, anything at all. Think about banners that can be used every year so that you're making a one-time investment uh, that you might replace them. And also banners that can be done for, um, for certain uh, signature, signature events. Banners are not that expensive. You can do a banner with just words on it for like 20, 25 bucks, a four by six banner. Uh, you can do something with art on it for like 40 bucks. I mean, this is not an insignificant amount of money. I, I understand that. But if you're buying three banners a year, I think even a church your size can come up with 120 bucks a year to do banners and replace them out. But you have to know what you're doing, what you're going to be using them for. And so, you know, have somebody sit down and think about a list of things that we could use banners for. Here's how we would put them up. Here's how we would use them. Uh, and um, and uh, again, we'll work with you on this. Uh, I think that's part of the partnership we see. Uh, we have people who do these for us. Maybe we can front front the cost of some. Um, maybe we can do some LSIM banners and we can trade them around. Whatever. Uh, but start thinking about how what kind of banners you would use. How would you use them inside and out? 
Banners are a good way to get people's attention inside your church. Uh, maybe a banner that says this way to the sanctuary. <laughs> you know, uh, something along those lines. This is an idea of a host. Uh, people, this doesn't have to be purchased, but building a small desk, uh, counter, an, old, an old countertop uh, with a desk underneath it with some cubby holes. You know, think outside the box uh, how you can do it. Uh, doesn't have to be very fancy, but it, it, it's something that can get people involved, perhaps in a, in a way of stewardship that's, that doesn't involve money. You may have people who are good with their hands. They can't uh, provide you with a lot of money, but they can provide you with some expertise here. Think outside the box. How can people in your congregation uh, make an investment in something like a welcome desk that would enhance and, uh, and build your ministry as a, as a welcome area? And this is an idea. This is a very simple-looking welcome desk. You see what it is? It's basically a plywood box with a countertop and a, and a chair behind it, and above it, a sign that says, Welcome Center. This is not rocket science, but take a look at what they've done for very little money. Uh, and, uh, and, and kind of imagine a place in your church, it would not have to be this big, it could be even half this size, where a person could stand behind her and sit on the stool and greet folks as they come in. And on top of that, you would have, like, here's a rack. It just has information in it. Here's a box. This box is probably, we have a collection box for eyeglasses through the Lions Club. People love this kind of stuff. It lets them know that your church is invested in something outside of itself. It's a passive message. You know, or you might have, you might want to do something toward, uh, toward some kind of ministry you're actively involved in. These are very inexpensive ways uh, to, to keep people connected. And that's the percept material. Questions, comments. We have a hand of passing out pupils to the kids who are here for the first time visitors. And so we give them a stuffed animal. But we only have one left, so <laughs> but we need to put a message on the power about the church. So, I'll more. But we need a message. Okay. Um, we did family of five visiting today, and they signed our, our book by the front door. So we meet you today. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I got somebody pecking in my window. I can open the door. I'll be back. Give me 20 seconds. Okay. Let's talk about it. Everything in the back. We used to, at my old church, we did all that stuff. We had it. Signs and arrows pointing to the restroom, the sanctuary, the fellowship hall. Yeah. Something needs to be outside on that door to let them know that that's something you have in there. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm back. No. They know that the toilet doesn't close Who's our sign for the I don't know, but we had that at our old church. Sign Smith? Sign Smith? Oh, Sean. Uh -huh. Alright. I, I like I like the fact that there's some animated conversation going on. I'm gonna give you time to do that because I think that's really important. I'll let your pastor monitor that conversation. I have one more quick thing to share with you. And then I'll, I'll open it up for any final questions, and I'm going to turn you loose, okay? Um, this is a plan for new member assimilation. I'm not going to go into detail on this, except I'm going to walk through it to give you an idea of what, of the, of the leg I think that's most difficult and is often <clears throat> missing in an evangelism program. We can, we can be very inventive about, invent, about inviting people in, very inventive about providing uh, mechanisms for making them feel welcome once they come in, but once they're there, we haven't got a clue what to do with them. Because they have to break into a system that is already established, that already has connections and, and tendrils and long-standing relationships. And that is the most foreboding and difficult thing to break down. That's why so many people look at churches, especially single-cell churches like yours, as being cliquish and clannish. You're not. But when you're on the outside trying to find a way in, that's the way it looks. You have to honor what people see, even if it's not true. So let me talk about a way in which you can start to overcome this by changing the culture both inside your building and as you interact with new people. For example, we're going to get somebody, we're going to assume they actually get them to join. On the day that they join, you introduce them to the congregation, 
you invite them to a new member gathering that's going to come in the future. You don't do something with them on that day because that becomes then, okay, you graduate, here's your gift, thank you very much, you're gone. No, the idea is that in three months or four months, we're going to have a new member event. We're going to invite you back. It's going to be a meal. You're going to have. You're going to. You're going to meet your your um, your um, uh, your shepherd, your council member, whoever is walking on you. We're going to talk about how you know what you need to do to fit in better. You're going to have that coming up. So there's always something for you to invite them to, and then you're going to get their information. Don't. You're not going to assume that the information is going to be coming ahead of time. Get them to join, and then get the information you need after they're joining. It's a step of getting them in. Tell, tell me about your kids, because if you're looking at boomers, most of the kids are probably gone. Tell me about your grandchildren. We know who they are. Tell me about you know your travel plans. Tell me about you, you spend the winter in, in Florida, these kinds of things. You're going to get the information, and you're going to take their picture. All that on the day they join. In the first two weeks, they're going to get a, going to get a letter from the pastor, and they're going to get a letter from the council president or the head of the stewardship team, whichever one you decide. And they're going to have two things in them. One is a time and talent sheet. Who are you and what do you do? Here's places where we have openings. Anything interests you. Second, they're going to have an estimate of giving card. You're not going to wait till the next stewardship event to talk about it. You're going to send it to them and say, you know, if you'd like to do this right now, we want you to know this is part of who we are. If you want to wait till the next stewardship day, it's on this day coming up so you know about it. Don't make it a surprise. Uh, but those two things are going to, you ask them to return them by the time of the new member gathering. So if that's three months in advance, that's when they're going to do it. If it's two weeks in advance, that's when they're going to do it. And you're going to follow up, going to remind them of it. The regular new members gathering, you schedule it, you make sure it happens. For a church your size, probably once a year, but you might want to do it twice a year. We do it four times a year. Going to track attendance for everybody, all the time. Somebody is responsible for checking if person A is here on the first Sunday and the second Sunday, third, fourth, and fifth Sunday every time. Put together a system. You're not that complicated. Quit assuming that you know when people are in church because, frankly, you don't. Even a small system. I'm having this conversation today. Um, I do attendance every week. Drives my poor wife crazy. But I do it every week. I, or, or, and the other pastor does it, too. <clears throat> I know when somebody's here when they're not here. Today I had a couple that used to be every week. I haven't seen them for, for a month and a half. I missed them. So I talked to them. I said, they said, you know, we've been here twice in the last six weeks, and you weren't. And I realized they were right. One week I was on vacation. One week I was doing something else. So I missed them. They were here. I wasn't. But it's been six weeks since I saw them. When I asked other people and staff, have you seen such and so, they went, well, weren't they just in church last week? They're accustomed to seeing them all the time. You don't miss people. You might see they're gone a week or two weeks. You still don't miss them. It's not until they've been gone a very long time that you start to miss them. And by then, it's almost too late. You can't rely upon one person. They have to track the attendance. And new people in particular, they've got to, they are the most likely to quit coming. You're already not used to seeing them. <laughs> so you've got to make sure that you're on top of this. And if they miss two or three Sundays in a row, somebody has to call them and say, is everything okay? And maybe that's just their pattern. You don't know that. You find out about that. So you've got to care about it. You won't know if you don't track their attendance. At the end of you do it closely for 90 days. If they're not there more than half the time, you've got a problem. If they're not there more than half the time, you've got a problem. And if, and if uh, after 90 days, there should be a plan of action. They should receive a, a letter of concern, an email, a phone call, something. Not from your pastor. The pastor is the last person to go. It's got to be somebody in the congregation. They expect the pastor to come. That's what the pastor gets paid to do. I know that's not true, but that's the, that's the attitude. But somebody from the congregation does not get paid to make a phone call. That means something, trust me. An inquirer's class is something you can have that has nothing to do with new members. Maybe you've got people who've been attending and you say, you know what? Maybe they need to know more about us. So every now and then the pastor says, you know what? First month of the quarter, I'm going to have an inquirer's class. We're going to have coffee. If your service is at 10.30, from 10 until 10.30, I'm going to meet in the, in the table behind the Welcome Center. Anybody who's interested, show up. You go there. If nobody shows up, no big deal. It might be a member that shows up. That's fine. Opportunity for conversation. But it's an inquirer's class. They want to know more about the church, about the denomination, about the faith, about the pastor. They are there to ask questions. You're there to answer them, so there's no agenda. An inquirer's class is inquiry. 
you will make sure that anybody who's attended in your church gets a special invitation to what's coming next. And if you don't know what's coming next, plan something. <laughs> plan something. And that does not have to be uh, where, you know, we want to entertain you. Let's entertain you. It can be, hey, the garage sale is coming up. We're raising money for Bethel Churches United. Maybe it's something you might be interested in coming to, not to work, but to buy something. Because all the money goes out. That's an invitation. You will invite them intentionally. They won't know about what's going on. They'll see garage sale and have no clue at all what that's all about. So you always assume that your interview is something that is special, that's, that's, that you want them to come to, and it's part of who you are as a culture, and it's not worship. Of course, you, wanna, you will want to invite them to Christmas Eve and Easter and those kinds of things as well. Discipleship class is something you do after they join. Joining is the first step in discipleship. It's not the last one. Now it's like saying we're going to have a discipleship class, and this is where you will gather new people and old people. Everybody feels like they need to know more about who they are as a disciple. So, uh, Peter, this is to you. You do a discipleship 101 class. You might want to, you might want to uh, palm that off on somebody else and say, "Here, can you do a three-session class in basic Christian Christian faith? Will you teach it? I'll attend, but I'm not going to lead it." And then discipleship 201 is all right. Next step, and you're going to do those classes, and you might do a 301 class if you really want to get into the depth. And Peter, you would be very good at this because you could go to a 301 or 401 class with your understanding of of spirituality and that kind of stuff. That could be an advanced class. You will attract different people every, but the, but the idea is that everybody who comes is seeking to deepen their relationship with Jesus and to become a more effective disciple of Jesus. That's the goal of every one of those classes. It has to be uh, geared toward people at different levels. So 101 and 201 is the least, but you might go up to a 301, 401, 501. You, there's, no, there's no limit to this. And this starts getting people back in the habit of coming to adult education, and the assumption is you don't know everything you need to know ever. The last discipleship class you go to ends with them closing the casket and throwing dirt in the box. That's when it stops. Because up to that time, everybody is still in a, in a discipleship learning mode. An annual event for new members? Talked about that okay already. Okay, that's a quick kind of down and dirty assimilation program. Uh, you'll see in your manual, this is really laid out in gruesome detail, and materials are provided. You can adapt that. You can you can find your own. This is just a, a, a way that I suggest we do it, uh, but that's all it is, is a suggestion. Uh, you'll have to adapt it for your own culture and your own ability to, to bring people and resources to bear. All right, questions. It's not like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it's work it's work that's worth doing. Any work that you do in the church has got to be worth doing. It's as simple as that. And you know what, uh, Linda, you know that better anybody because you you put your hand in the dirt and you grow things. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. I, it's, it's more work than I'm willing to do. You know, except that I do this kind of work too, and it's the same thing. You put your hands in the dirt and you grow things. And whether it's disciples or strawberries, does hardly matter. Hardly matters. It's the same kind of work. But the work is good. The work is holy. The work is empowering. The work is its own benefit too. There's nothing better. I don't care whether we're talking about. I used to be in a furniture business. Whether it's rearranging an entire showroom floor uh, to make it more appealing to a customer. Uh, there's nothing more satisfying after you've sweated and to look at the at the at the end result of that. It's beautiful. It's effective. You've done good. This is, this is the kind of work here that's even holier in this way. Because here you're, you're bringing in the harvest of disciples. You're bringing in the harvest that Jesus said is ready. You're a laborer in the field. It's good work. Uh, and, it's, and it's worth your while. It will grow your church. The thing that you find valuable that you love so dearly, the system that you're, you're striving to this is worth talking about. All you've got to do is ask a simple question of yourself. What do I love about this place? What do I love about this people? It might only be one thing. That's okay. That's the thing you talk about. They go out and plant the seed. Who you talk to? Friends, relatives, associates, neighbors, friend. These people are not... Will they listen to you? They're just like you. They're boomers. Don't assume they're too poor or too stupid. Neither one of those is true. Don't assume that you don't have what they want because they've already told you through the, through the process that they like traditional worship. They like it. So make yours better. That's the, that's the challenge for your pastor and your worship leaders. How can we make it even better? Something that's already good. You've got something to sell. If I were in the furniture business, I'd say, you've got a hell of a sofa here. Quit apologizing for it. Put it, on the, put it on the floor and ask for the price. People will buy it.
didn't hear any amen, so I'm going to assume that you're a bunch of Lutherans out there. <laughs> I, last week, I had two people here with me. Yep. One was my sister, and one was my friend Connie, who was my sister's nursing aide when she was in the nursing home. Yep. A third person who's going to start coming with me who is a friend of mine since I was in graduate school in the early 70s. And the reason that they're coming with me is because I talk about what happens to me here. Yep. What happens to me in this congregation is valuable. Yep. And I know it's valuable to everybody who's sitting here. But when was the last time that you shared what that value is with somebody else you know. Because if they're not in this kind of a group resource, then in all likelihood they're looking for it or don't know that they're looking for it. Right. And if you don't say, you know, I had this experience and share it, nobody will ever know. I mean, I don't want to sit here and wait until people happen to knock on the door at the only church in Donald's. <laughs> Go ahead, Vicki, I see you. Okay. I come from Columbus, and Hilltop Luther Church was a very intimidating place for people in the neighborhood. It's an urban thing. But, we got outside the church walls. We were in the yard. We were up and down the street partying and doing all kinds of activities outside the church. That's a way to bring people inside the church. Yep. Also, there were people in our neighborhood who couldn't read. There were homeless people. There were people just passing by. There were people looking for churches, old, young. We had activities for kids. That brings people into your church. But the advantage is you had is you were in an urban setting. Yeah, in the urban setting, but we had a lot of homeless people there, like the human thing. We did the dinners like like the, the church that they go to. We did breakfast, we did dinners, we did parties for the neighborhood. We did all kinds of things. And then on the other hand, there are people who are thirsty for the gospel. We, what we had after we were searching and searching for a pastor, we did the congregation did to get cases of Bibles, not fancy Bibles, paperback Bibles. Give them to the people. Help them to meet Jesus where they are. And with our help too. Like the Bibles, yeah, I like the way you're all talking. Uh, but I like the way you're all talking. Um, I'm off the topic, but that's how you get people into the world. Uh, no, she's not talking about the topic. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm off topic. No, I said I like what you're talking. I like how you're talking. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I was into the evangelism thing for a long time, and I kind of lost it when I, got, when I came here. Yeah. That is good. Well, and I, that, doors that you don't think you will open for you. And if you pray and believe and get into the Word, and small groups do it too. Small groups. It doesn't have to be anything big. It could be the mothers coming together to talk about their kids. Right. It could be guys coming together to talk about a project that they're going to do in the church. It's small things like that. You can get them together to do something that they're interested in. Right. Let's, let me assume. Right. Let me assume that one thing that's true that you are a small group, uh, and mm -hmm. that you, and that you have uh, some homogeneity and commonality amongst you. What that means is is that your your first goal is not necessarily to attract people that aren't that that are unlike you. That's that's kind of like a, that's an alter, that's a secondary or tertiary goal. Your first goal is to attract people that are just like you. People who share exactly your values, 
So I'm looking here. I got what four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, about fifteen, sixteen people sitting here in the pews. So your goal is to go out and find sixteen people that think, act, talk, and value just like you to to, to be a church. Now, if you were as I as I explained to one of your council your counselor the night, your goal in the first year might only be to get five or ten new members. That's that sounds pretty intimidating, but it's not that many people. Five or ten people in a year, but it would transform who you were because you would be increasing your attendance with five or ten people by by 25 or 30 percent. It's a huge – so we're not trying to eat the whole elephant in one setting. We'll just eat it one bite at a time. Uh, but you can do this. So the this is – all of these ideas, what you need to do is put them all on the table, and then you pick out two or three that you know you can do, uh, what we used to call in the business the low-hanging fruit, the quick victories. You can do this. Grab a couple of those things. Make them work. If they don't work, learn from your mistakes and move on to the next one. Don't give up. Um, you, are not so, you are not so challenged or delicate or fragile right now that you can't afford to fail. That's crap. Of course you can afford to fail. You can't f afford to continually fail. That's the, there's a difference. So think, think in terms of what you can do and then go out and do it. It, it relies upon friends, relatives, associates, neighbors. This is still your primary goal because these are people whom you know and trust and whom know and trust you. So, um, so Vicki, when you, when you share your passion, Linda, when you share your, your passion, these are people you, that know who you are. They trust you. As I said before, if you went to a great movie, my wife and I saw Wonder Woman yesterday. It's a great movie. Go see it. It's fun. It's a terrific movie. We also had dinner the other night in New Carlisle. A place that we'd forgotten existed. What was the name of it? Mac Studebaker. Studebaker's. No, no. I don't know. Okay. Where's it at? It's there at the end of town right before you get to the... Yeah. Sorry about the bus. Now, I don't do that because I'm telling you. That's my point. You uh, don't like it, but I did. I liked it. We went there and we were surprised how much we liked it. We'd forgotten it. So you guys take a... This is what's happening. You're looking at your shirt going, ah, we don't have anything to offer. Crap, you don't. You've got lots to offer. you got lots to offer. Maybe... Maybe you won't go to that. Yeah, maybe you won't go. But we don't have any place like that in Fairborn. And that's what we like. We like that comfort food. We like sitting down with folks that are like us. We like we like being waited on. We miss Roush's, for heaven's sake. We miss it. Maybe people wouldn't cross the street to go to Roush's, but it was a good place to eat. You can't presume uh, that, what, that, that people won't come to a place like that. They will. You can't presume that because you're small, people won't like you. That's exactly what makes you so charming and worthwhile. Mm -hmm. People don't, I don't want to go to a place with a thousand folks. I can't stand that. It drives me crazy. I, I, whenever I come to your place, I feel right at home. Other people will too. Now, you're not going to outgrow that. Look around you. Look around you right now where you're at. Physically, you can only be about two to three times your size before you're going to have to buy a new sanctuary. That's all. No, two, two services. I know that's exactly right. You go to two services. That's exactly right. You think and you think differently. You think outside the box. That's my point. But when you go to two services, trust me when I tell you, you'll have two congregations. They'll have commonality, but there'll be two different groups of people, and that's okay too. There'll be that's when you go from as you as Vicky talked about small groups. You go from one small group to two small groups to three small groups. They all share a common purpose. They all are moving in the same direction, but they're different. They're different. That's how you grow. Right now, what you're looking at is to expand the small group that, that is you. Expand that small group until it gets big enough to, to it doesn't have to divide, but we are going to have to look out. Then you start looking beyond the boundaries and getting different people in. Focus on folks that are like you first. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. Here's the next step. You need to appoint from yourselves. Uh, Bill, you're there in the back. I see you. Got you in the back, Bill. No, he's not here. Not here. I thought I was here, Bill. <laughs> okay, that's Bill. All right. I thought that was you. I got my uh, my uh, camera's a little fuzzy, but I thought that was you beside John. I know John. I see John. Okay. Bill, here's here's the thing. You want to appoint about uh, two to three people uh, besides yourself or whomever else you want. Sit down and do some brainstorming. The brainstorming is simply this. You want to have a, uh, two or three events over the next six months uh, that you think you can, put, you can pull off as a congregation. Things that your people would like to come to, 
but things that you can invite people to. Uh, Vicky gave some ideas like a, like a dinner, like a breakfast, right? Something along those lines that you can invite the community to. You've got one already on the books for the 5th. That's going to be a big event. But remember, you want these things to be connected to your worship life. Because the, whatever it is, it should be connected to your worship life. People are going to come to church. And then on those days, you pull out the stops. Every Sunday's Easter Sunday in your place. <laughs> All right? Make, make sure that you're not pulling them in at a time when two-thirds of your people are on vacation and there's no music. That would not be a good thing. So you got to think in terms of the calendar and all that. Put those things out and start working toward them. Build. And then, after people come, and you get those, get those volunteers, make sure that you've got a system in place for how to deal with visitors. Some of the things I talked about here at the end. That's what that group would do. Plan some events and put together some, uh, <coughs> put together some system by which you would um, uh, deal with visitors and then start doing it. Change the culture inside the building so that po folks outside the building will have some place to land. Because you have all of the tools you need. Okay. Now, we exist to work with you. We'll bring you people. We'll bring you resources. Don't let the fact that you don't have something be the reason you don't do something. Ask. As I said, we got somebody does banners. we got somebody does signs. We'll work this out with you. Don't worry about it. Don't make money the reason you don't do something either. You don't have to spend a ton of money. Think about what you what your folks can do and think about what we can do with you. Well, right now, it costs you nothing but time. And don't expect the turnaround to happen overnight. This, di this didn't happen where you're living overnight. We're looking at, I say, three months, six months, three years, five years. That's what we're looking at. We can't get something to turn around in five years, then okay. I'll, I'll throw my hands up. But I'm going to be around for that unless Jesus takes me. I'm going to be around, and I'm going to be up your backsides. Thank you for the encouraging words. Ah, I love you too. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Turn around, BJ. BJ. BJ, turn around. There you go. Did you get something together with prices? Can I get something together? What? With pricing. Pricing. Things like that, so that's way here we can. You let me know what you want, BJ, and I'll let you know what it'll cost. Absolutely. If you have some ideas, just put them on paper, and I'll let, I'll let you know what it'll cost you, which might be nothing, but don't, don't let cost be the determining factor, okay? And, I, and I, I think I hear what you're saying. Yes, it's not expensive. Banners, as I said, you can get banners for 25, 30 bucks. You can get sign yard, yard signs for like 10, 15 bucks because we can print them in-house. But what you put on them? That's the issue. How you use them, that's the issue. So put your plan together and say, Here's the, so then we'll put the program together. Money is not an object. I mean, it is an object, but it's not the object, okay? We'll get you started. We are your partners here. We want you to succeed. And by we, I mean St. Mark's and Abiding Christ and Good Shepherd and you guys. We're partners in this. We want us all to succeed. There is no future in all of us not succeeding. And there's no reason why you can't succeed. I'm not just blowing smoke. I know who you are. You've got a lot to uh, go on for you. And those churches that I left in the Hilliards, and uh, we started out with a rock festival. And the first year and now we did $8,000. Today, we've got to come up and that. Last year, they did 125000 Wow. You got people that hang out just to get there because it's got homemade uh, German potato salad. They have coleslaw. They've got sauerkraut. They've got the broth. They've got hot dogs. They've got chicken sandwiches. And all the pies of them are made fresh. And, that. and you know, I like. Uh, I, don't, I know we can't get something like that done here. But they had the beer wagon and everything else. And for a Lutheran church, you know, to have a beer wagon, it started out really, you know, like. They frown upon it. If Luther were around, he'd run the beer wagon. You know that. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. That's no, his did. wife would. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 
My wife is agreeing with that, Peter. What? <laughs> My wife is here. She agrees with that. She'd want it too. <laughs> well, we used to have the uh, community picnic in September. There you go. We invited the community in. Uh, we had the mule skitter band in. Uh, you know. It's a great idea. That's a great idea, and it's a, and it's like yeah. Any, any, any community event that already exists that you can plug into, that's a great idea. Yeah, and start integrating your church back into the community. That's a great idea because, again, Donaldsville may have a certain character, but it's just as unchurched as every place around it. You're the only congregation in town. You are it. And you're right in the center of town, too. It's like people can ignore you. No. And you have bells. That's right. Right, I remember that. Do your bells still work? Do what? Do your bells work? The carillon? Oh, every Sunday. We did. I don't have one. <laughs> which which one? Which one? The chimes with the organ? We have chimes inside the building. We outside. do not have a carillon. Outside. No, you know? the, the bells outside. And we don't have one outside. We have. We Never have. did. Bell that you ring. We have one big bell, and it's in the, in the bell tower by the street. Does it work? Yeah, yeah. we ring it every Sunday morning. If you rang it on a on a day other than Sunday, would anybody be so shocked? No, they just wonder what what could be going on and why we'd be doing that. That'd be a good thing for them to wonder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Gardening and all that with Linda, and she's just gonna come down here to get some property looking, and then Linda goes in, does her thing, and John, 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 John's got it going too. We'll leave him out. <laughs> so I mean, everything is you know, we got all this stuff. I mean, coming up, um, the community garden is a great thing, man. Except you got some people with beer and they're selfish. Right. But the police look after it for us. <laughs> oh no, I, I did it. I was working on the side on the side one year, and this woman was there. She even had her van parked there, and she had eight, eight to ten bags of uh, green beans. And I said, you know, this is a community garden. She said, I know. And she got in the van to go. She obviously knew. <clears throat> <laughs> I would say that one of the things that you might, one of the, one of the factors is is to, is to take what you already do well and systematize it. I think you do a lot of things good, but the two challenges is that the community sometimes has difficulty connecting the good things you do with the ministry of your church. Uh, they don't necessarily see the connection, or they're not aware of it. They don't know this is a rise in Christ's ministry. So, you know, part of that is how do you toot your own horn without sounding prideful? But you do want people to know this is that your outreach in the community is about your passion and commitment to outreach in the community for the, in the name of Christ. We do this a lot as Lutherans. I, I, I said we, we, we involve ourselves in so much social ministry, which is wonderful. And we say to ourselves, we do this because Jesus would have us to do it, which is true. But I'm wondering if the people who receive this gift are as aware of it as we are. Do they know that we're doing this because this is what Christ has compelled and commanded us to do, Matthew 25? Do, we, do they know that? And if they don't know that, why? Why do they not know that? It's incumbent upon us. Jesus sent us out, as you heard in today's gospel lesson, to proclaim and to baptize and to teach. Those, those are not accidental activities. They're intentional activities. And we, we, we have not been able to kind of make the connection, run the golden thread through what we do. I think that part of what evangelism is, is making sure the golden thread runs through everything we do. The golden thread is the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and how that has created us as a community that goes out and feeds in his name, cares in his name, works in his name, proclaims in his name, baptizes in his name. That's the golden thread that's missing. We've allowed that to become a program. It needs to be a culture. 
So I'm not, I don't think you need to do anything differently. Uh, I mean, I don't think you need to do the things differently. I think we need to do differently the things that we do. Uh, if you catch, if you can catch my nuance there, that's going to be the challenge. Is is where we are more intentional about how what we do proclaims the reality and, and the power and the presence of Jesus Christ, and, and unapologetically does that. And we just don't presume that you know. I say when you look at that at that map where you have the no, no faith. And, and you suffer to 40% of the people that live in this have no faith connection? How did that happen? How did it happen in a country that purports itself to be Christian or religious at the very least? How did it happen in a place where there's a church on every freaking corner? How did that happen? It didn't happen by accident. It happened by intention or a lack of intention. Let's fix that. More time. You need to find out by the time. Mm-hmm. Wayfaring signs are, are a good way to let people know who you are. And really... What else? Yeah, it says why would you do it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, it might be interesting to think about banners that have Bible, short Bible quotes that relate to what we do, and then the yard sign kinds of things that say VCU and community garden when you know feed when Jesus says feed the hungry. Absolutely. These are the kind of brainstorming ideas. Get your group together, feed them in, pick a pick a number of them that you can do and then do them. <laughs> Start changing the culture by changing how not what you do but how you do it. That's all. You don't need to invent new ways to serve the community. You do that great. I really mean that. Your congregation, for its size and its impact, does more to, to care for folks in need than congregations ten times your size, some congregations. This is not a bad thing. But what you need to do better is to make the connection between what you do and the story of Jesus. And, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Some of the very excellent suggestions you've made are ways to do that. So go have that brainstorming session. I'm out of, it. I'm out of time. <laughs> I'm out of brain power. And I'm tired. All right. I'm going to call this a day. Thank you so much for coming. You guys appreciate it very much. And I'll, I'll let, and I, I stand, Bill and all of you, I'm here to help you. Let me know what you need me to do next. BJ, let me know if you get to that place where here's the things we'd like to have. Just send me a list. I'll make sure that I get you an itemized cost. Okay? All right. All righty. All right. Blessings Thanks. to you all. <laughs> blessings back to you. Right. See you later. <laughs> Bye, wherever you are. Bye. Oh, my. Oh, my.